Hello. In this series of videos, I'm going to be reviewing the, whatever, four or five homework questions for uh, Miller, Chapter 26, about oligopoly and strategic behavior. Uh, in this first segment, I'm going to knock out two of those questions because they're basically uh, repetition of the same kind of thing, just to explore some terminology. So I'm going to start with uh, Chapter 26, Number 5, and then I'll do Number 6 in this recording. So number five goes something like this. Characterize each of the following as a positive sum game, a zero sum game, or a negative sum game. In letter A, the scenario is an office workers, office workers contribute $10 each to a pool of funds, and whoever best predicts the winners in a professional sports playoff wins the entire sum. I think uh, that last bit is kind of a giveaway. I don't know. Uh, this is a zero-sum game, and that is because of this word sum, it means total. Uh, what goes into the pot is what gets distributed back out of the pot. So it's a zero-sum game. In total, there's no change from what goes in to what goes out. That's why I think sum is kind of a telltale for letter A. So that's what it is and why it is. Letter B. After three years of fighting with large losses of human lives and material, neither nation involved in a war is any closer to its objective than it was before the war began. Well, uh, this one's kind of also a dead giveaway because it's not very happy and cheery, I think. So uh, this is a negative sum game, and that is because each side is bearing some costs of war and there has been no objective obtained. So there's no, uh, there's not even, uh, it's not even zero sum where one side has captured something of great value or something. It's not even, not even close uh, because it's all loss on the part of both sides. Uh, we aren't told what the objective is, I just note. Um, so we have no idea of the cost benefit they face, but we do know that both sides are entirely facing costs. Letter C. Two collectors who previously owned in incomplete and nearly worthless sets of trading cards exchanged several cards and, as a result, both end up with completed sets with significant market value. So, now two parties have co come together and formed some synergy between them with cooperation, and there at least one is better off. Now, it could have been just as true if they both came together and one just gave over cards to the other one and didn't because they didn't care they were indifferent and the other one was better off you would have at least one party being made better off without making the other one worse off you'd have at least one party being net sum positive better off so this is a positive sum game in total the synergy created uh, has yielded some outcome that is in sum greater than it was before they started and that brings me to uh, sort of a, a clarification of a term that I don't believe is really defined in the book. You, you have to kind of infer this. And I know it's challenging uh, because when we hear of a game and we look at these payoff matrices and things like this, we think of things like board games, you know, like Monopoly or card games and stuff like that. You know, Uno stuff. You know, uh, games where, or even Stratego, that's a fun one that's kind of related to this, these games, where, or even in sports, where... Um, there's a competitive arena about a game. Like that's when we hear a game, we often think of something in competition. And this last one is where I want to point out that here a game just means um, I have it as an interaction of two or more parties. It's just an interaction. It need not necessarily be some kind of a competition or, or a challenge or something like that. But it's just this interaction of parties that we're examining here with game theory. And this last one, I think brings that home. These two card collectors are doing this because they're interested in it. They get together and they form some synergistic kind of trade where they're at least one is better off. And that's still a game. And so we can have positive sum games. And I think sometimes when this is hard to understand, it's because of our preconceived notions of what a game is and the borrowing of that term by economics that makes understanding this maybe a little more challenging than it has to be. So let's see if that helps with the second one, which is number six. Characterize each of the following as a positive sum game, a zero sum game, or a negative sum game. Letter A. 
you have a card game in your dorm room with three other students. Each player brings $5 to the game to bet on the outcome. Winner take all. Well, if it's $15 going in, and it's $15 going out, like it's $15 coming in from three sources, it's $15 going out to one source. So what is the sum, what is the net change? Sum means in total, net means total after any kind of deductions. So what is the change in this amount? Exactly zero. This is a zero sum game because the amount going in is equal to the amount going out. There's no positive or negative on that. It's just zero sum. So let's see what we can think of with letter B. Two nations exchange goods in a mutually beneficial transaction. So we're describing international trade. And so this is a positive sum game because there is more made. At least one party is made better off and the other one is at least the same. You could have both parties better off, countries in this example. So this is a positive sum game. The cooperation of the countries, and we've examined this, we're going to examine it further, the cooperation of the countries with each producing where they each have comparative advantage yields more goods and services in this two-nation world. So there's more than there would have been without the game, even though the game is not a confrontation or a challenge or a competition. Their interaction yields more goods and services, hence positive, being above zero. Some game. And then uh, this last one. A thousand people buy one dollar lottery tickets with a single payoff of eight hundred dollars. Does that sound like a winning proposition? Only for one. Uh, everyone else is a loser. The people playing in the game, net or in total, do the people playing the game yield the same outcome that they put in? Or do they yield something greater than they put in? No and no. They yield something less than they put in. So the people participating in the games, the players of the lottery, for them, this is a negative sum game. In total, they put in a thousand. The result of what can be taken home by one is 800. That's a net loss of $200. Now that goes to, in the example of lottery, to the state. Um, generally, with gambling, we would say that would go to the house, you know, the casino or whatever. So, the host of the, the card game, whatever. So, the point here is that there's a little bit of a definition of terms aspect of this is in who we're defining as the players. If we define the players as those people participating in the lottery, hands down, it's a negative sum game. And that's how lottery is. That's why states run lottery, is to make money. It's a voluntary tax. Um, they raise money. Uh, now, if we were to redefine the game and include the dealer or the house or the state, then the amount going in would be the amount coming out. But we know that the state, the dealer, the house is going to get a take. And so it just depends on how we define the game or the players of the game. But the way it's defined here with the players being those who play the lottery, they're going to leave in net across all the players with less than they put in. So number six C is a negative sum game, and that is the reason why it is so. And I have no further things to note, so I hope that these two uh, made sense and uh, expanded your understanding just a little.